Hello everyone. We have last left off with the birth of Buddhism in India and we noted that Buddhism was one of the most significant cultural exports from the Indian subcontinent. However, it never really takes off in India. Uh, it never becomes the dominant religion there, or at least its, its time as the dominant religion in India is rather short-lived. So how then does Buddhism survive and grow? How does it become one of the major world religions uh, uh, to this day? The answer is that Buddhism spreads out from the subcontinent into new parts of the world along the Silk Road trade networks. And we have mentioned the Silk Road in passing several times, but today we are finally going to talk about exactly what it is. We will also look at specifically the spread of Buddhism along the Silk Road into China in particular. And it's that spread of Buddhism into China that allows this religion to flourish and become the major world religion that it is today. So let's take a look at how the Silk Road becomes this huge conduit for cross-cultural exchange in the ancient world. Today's thesis, the movement of goods, people, and ideas along the Silk Road tied the eastern and western reaches of Eurasia together in various ways for centuries. As a vehicle for sustained cross-cultural contact, the Silk Road represents an early version of globalization or a world system. Cultural practices shared along the Silk Road were adapted to new contexts. Simultaneously, these new practices influenced the societies which encountered them. Okay, so let me just say a couple things about this uh, thesis statement. Uh, I wanted to zero in on, on the middle statement there that uh, the Silk Road is this vehicle for sustained cross-cultural contact, represents an early version of globalization uh, or a world system. And world system is a concept that originated uh, from uh, a scholar uh, called Emanuel Wallerstein. Um, and it is kind of in a nutshell, it's, it's this idea of, of a block uh, of the world, a, a huge kind of super region that is deeply interconnected. Uh, Wallerstein was especially uh, interested in economic uh, interconnections. But we can kind of expand this concept to include cultural connections um, uh, and others. And for our purposes here, we're going to use world system um, in, in the same way as we have used globalization uh, uh, this semester. And that is to say that we, we see um, not only interconnection, but elements of a common culture uh, across whatever region it is that we are focusing on. Our main uh, emphasis thus far has been on Eurasia, kind of you know the, the greater Mediterranean world, uh, Central Asia, and then East Asia. And the Silk Road is this mechanism that does indeed bind those places together in some way. So that's what the argument is here. Uh, we, we can look at this kind of chunk of the world and say that, yeah, we do, we do have a, uh, a version of an interconnected world system. So uh, what's the question then that this argument is answering? It really has to do with the big impact of the Silk Road. What, what's, the, what's the thing that the Silk Road kind of caused uh, uh, large scale? And so we need a question that addresses that. So a good question here would be, what was the overall impact of the Silk Road? Or what was the major significance of the Silk Road from an interregional perspective? And that would be tying the, 
the movement of goods, people, and ideas, tying uh, this region of the world together. And, and crucially, it's a vehicle for sustained cross-cultural contact. That's, that's something that I really want to emphasize here, um, that it's, it's not just a, a kind of limited period of time. It's not just a, a series of events that then uh, sort of wanes. Th this is something that's around for a long, long, long time. And it explains a lot of the pre-modern interconnection uh, between the, the different areas of Eurasia. So first off, let's uh, just establish the fact that the Silk Road is not an actual road. <laughs> um, it, it's not a, a marketplace. It's not even a single route. Um, so you know th that's kind of a misnomer. There's there's a, a recent uh, show on Netflix called Marco Polo that um, uh, tells the story of this Venetian trader Marco Polo who travels along the Silk Road to uh, China uh, to uh, the Yuan Dynasty, which is China under the, the control of the Mongols. And um, Marco Polo is from a trading family, and so he wants to do business in China. And he says something like, uh, um, we would like to trade along your great Silk Road. Uh, he says this to, to the Yuan Emperor, uh, Kublai Khan. And that's just something that would not have happened. The Silk Road was not, um, uh, this is a um, contemporary term. This is a modern term that scholars have applied to this large phenomenon of uh, this big network of uh, um, routes and marketplaces and so on. So it's not, the Silk Road is not a, a single sort of physical thing that we can point at. Uh, uh, it's not a specific place. Uh, uh, and it's definitely not a specific, you know, road that you, you wouldn't see a street sign, for example, that says, you know, Silk Road this way. Uh, that's just not what it is. Th this is uh, a, a, a term that we have applied to this large historical uh, phenomenon. So what is that phenomenon? Well, it's a network. That's why I've uh, highlighted that word up there. The Silk Road is a network. It's a network of a bunch of different marketplaces, a bunch of different trade routes. Uh, all of them together amount to what scholars refer to as the Silk Road. Um, people at the time did not, they, they did not say to one another, let's go travel along the Silk Road or let's go down to the Silk Road market and buy something. You know, so it, it's nothing It's nothing like this. Uh, uh, Silk Road 2.0, the anonymous marketplace where you could go and buy all kinds of um, things that you don't want people to know that you're buying. Uh, that's, not, that's not the historical Silk Road. And just to kind of hammer this point home, the, the people who traveled along the Silk Road and did business there, uh, they did not have a sense, at least the vast majority of them did not have a, a sense of the, the whole extent of this network. That is to say that very, very few people traveled the entire length of the Silk Road. Uh, as a matter of fact, that there's only a, a couple of examples that we know of, of travelers who did kind of go from one end of Eurasia to the other. Uh, and, and that didn't happen until very uh, uh, late uh, uh, in the days of the Mongol Empire. So everyone who, who participates in this thing, uh, they, they're just kind of aware of their little, little section of it. You can think of this as b a bunch of links in, in a great chain. And everybody has their particular link for their series of marketplaces that they do business in. Maybe their you know caravan route that they travel back and forth, um, and they uh, in many cases may not know the the ultimate origin or destination of of the goods that they are uh, trading in. So this is quite significant. Remember uh, uh, to to know these kind of basic facts about what the Silk Road is. Here is a map that gives you a, a good idea of. Um, the, the rough estimates of, of where these routes were. We've seen this map before, but again, 
don't don't think of this in terms of you know if you're going to go travel uh, and do business on the Silk Road, you don't start out here and then travel all along the maritime route until you make it to your destination in the Sinai Peninsula. Uh, that's not how this works. What we have instead is essentially a bunch of of middlemen uh, all along the way who take goods from one point, uh, uh, ship them to another point, uh, uh, and and uh, exchange them along the way. The Silk Road also is um, the you know the name has road right in the name there, but it's it, it's also a maritime route. So it, it's both land and sea routes that uh, comprise this network. Uh, and those routes change over time. Different um, uh, roads, different uh, sea lanes uh, become part of the Silk Road network depending on you know, the circumstances in uh, um, different regions. So for example, the, the Persian Royal Road built under the Achaemenid Empire that uh, traverses Central Asia here, that becomes a part of, of the Silk Road route. Eventually, as these, this network kind of matures, we essentially have three routes. You have the, the Northern Overland Route, which is the one that's probably the most well-known. You have the southern maritime route, which goes through Southeast Asia, and it's, it's essentially a, a coastal route along the, the northern coast of the Indian Ocean. Uh, and then there's kind of an intermediary uh, overland route that traverses uh, through the Arabian Peninsula, the caravan routes, uh, sort of a hybrid of overland and, and marine routes that uh, rely upon Arab caravan networks through the deserts. But we're going to start by examining this overland route. Uh, it's the one that we've kind of previewed uh, uh, before. We last alluded to this overland route when we talked about the Han Dynasty. It was Emperor Wu, the martial emperor, late second century BCE, has a plan to expand the borders of his empire, uh, and indeed does so, adds a lot of territory in the south here. Uh, also really wanted to get rid of China's long-standing enemy in the north, those, those pesky nomadic uh, Xiongnu people. Um, previous Han rulers had been forced to accept this indemnity system uh, that really sticks in the craw of, of the emperor and his Confucian advisors. Uh, they don't like the fact that they, they have to treat the Xiongnu as equals and that they, they are um, uh, you know, having to stoop down to... to buying them off, essentially, in exchange for peace. Uh, so ex uh, paying off the Xiongnu with expensive Chinese goods like brocade uh, to prevent them from raiding the northern borders. This does not jive with the Chinese tributary system. This does not uh, uh, reflect the ideal uh, Confucian world order in which China, the Middle Kingdom, with the Emperor, the Son of Heaven, at the top uh, are, are supposed to be supreme and everybody else all of the um, uh, inferior states around the Middle Kingdom are supposed to accept the superiority of China the superiority of uh, the Chinese Emperor so if you you're trying to reconcile that ideology with the fact that uh, the Xiongnu are treated as diplomatic equals and, and China is, is actually paying uh, a indemnity to keep these people from attacking, uh, you know, this just doesn't work. This, this is something that needs to be um, uh, corrected. And, and so, uh, you know, Emperor Wu makes this one of his big uh, goals. He wants to defeat the Xiongnu, needs help. He was the guy who sent his official, Zhang Chen, uh, uh, who has a statue over here, uh, sends Zhang Chen to the west in search of allies uh, that the Chinese can employ to uh, uh, beat the Xiongnu. Zhang has this harrowing journey. Uh, you know, he's gone for 15 years or something, captured by the Xiongnu. 
uh, ends up um, starting a family with them, but eventually escapes. Ultimately does not find any allies, uh, but does find a lot of Chinese goods in a marketplace in what is today uh, Afghanistan, so way, way over here uh, in the West. And we, we said that Zhang's, uh, his, his journey, his uh, story is essentially the Chinese discovery of the Silk Road trade networks. Emperor Wu um, does eventually have military successes against the Xiongnu, and the Xiongnu Confederation declines by the mid-first century uh, CE. This initiates a push by the Chinese into the west along the Heishi Corridor, uh, uh, a series of garrison posts, uh, road networks extending out from China proper into uh, Central Asia. The Han Dynasty invests heavily in these fortifications. Here is the ruins of one. And you can see it's, it's this uh, uh, outpost way out in the middle of the desert. These are, were initially constructed around uh, small desert oases, but makes travel easier, safer, and more reliable in this area, uh, facilitates the movement of people, goods, ideas, etc. And some of these outposts uh, uh, gradually morph into towns and then even into cities. So these are all uh, interconnected processes that go together to uh, make movement through this part of the world uh, uh, more significant at this time. And we're, we're talking generally about kind of the first couple centuries CE. What were these towns like? Well, here's a picture of one. Small oases out in uh, uh, the middle of the desert through, or through the Heishi Corridor into the Taklamakan Desert, places where there was water. Uh, that is uh, basically what an oasis is. It's a small uh, spot where uh, there's water in an otherwise dry environment. And as I said, some of these grow to become pretty sizable trading cities as the volume of traffic increases. A great example of that phenomenon is Dunhuang, the picture that we're looking at right here. The name uh, itself means the blazing beacon. So that can kind of give you a sense of um, the function of this place. You know, you're, you're traveling along this long, expansive desert route and you see in the distance the, the blazing beacon that is Dunhuang, uh, and you know that this is a place where you can uh, stop over, uh, get supplies, rest, and, and perhaps do some business. In later centuries, uh, around 500 CE, Dunhuang becomes the site of a huge Buddhist complex. Uh, um, We'll talk about that when we look at the Tang Dynasty, but that's what's pictured up here. There's a uh, massive series of Buddhist temples carved right into the cliff face there, uh, and it becomes this um, uh, destination site for Buddhist uh, travelers uh, to come and, and practice their faith. But that's a little bit later. Um, Dunhuang is, is one of these places that gets its start as it's, it's just a small desert oasis, uh, becomes a garrison, uh, and then gradually morphs into a trading town, and, and then ultimately becomes a, um, a small city, let's say. How do you get around in this part of the world? Uh, you're looking at it right there. It is the camel. Uh, this is the native uh, uh, territory of the Bactrian camel. That's the two-humped camel that you're seeing there. Uh, the camel is relatively slow, certainly slower than a horse, but very strong and very reliable. Uh, camels store fat in their humps and can, um, so they can go for a long time without uh, food. They also have all kinds of special adaptations that make them well suited to the desert. Uh, they have very wide feet that allows them to walk on sand without sinking in. Uh, 
Uh, they have special eyelids that can keep the sand out of their eyes. Um, all, all sorts of things. Uh, some of you may have heard uh, of camels being referred to as the ship of the desert, and that, that's a pretty apt description. You, this part of the world is really is a giant sea of sand, and the camel is, is, your, is your ship to, to get you through that sea. But uh, it is the native habitat. The, the Heishi Corridor and the Taklamakan Desert is indeed the native habitat of the Bactrian camel. What was traded along this, this network of routes? As you may have guessed, the most famous commodity, uh, and certainly in the early centuries of the Silk Road network, is silk. That is indeed where the name comes from. Now, silk is quite a fascinating um, artifact, piece of technology, only produced in China in, in antiquity. Uh, so it's very rare and precious. Silk is extremely difficult to make, requires a lot of specialized knowledge, tools, uh, and then a, a bunch of, uh, it's very labor intensive uh, and very resource intensive. The process of making silk is, uh, it's, it's really uh, elaborate. Uh, but the basic way that this is done, silk is made from the cocoons of the larvae of the mulberry silkworm. Uh, and so uh, these, these mulberry silkworms are, are farmed for the express purpose of spinning cocoons that uh, can then be made into silk fibers. There's one, one of those little guys up there. They eat a ton, so you've got to have a ton of, of mulberry leaves to feed these things uh, uh, and, and get them to produce cocoons. When they do, this is the raw material that can be made into um, silk, and that can be done in, in several different ways. Um, you, can, you can use those little, uh, they look like cotton balls, uh, uh, known as silk floss. Um, that can be used as padding uh, to make quilted cloth uh, or blankets or coats, uh, which, which is great for the cold uh, winters of North China and the steppe. Uh, and then if you want to take a kind of further step, they can be spun into um, thread, which is then used to make uh, textiles. So silk has the advantage of being a, a very, very light fabric, but it's also extremely warm. So kind of the two combinations that you would want um, if you are uh, um, traveling around in this area. Because of its rarity, um, fine silk textiles come to be a symbol of power, luxury, prestige. Uh, silk is not only, you know, ha has these kind of practical qualities, but it's, it's very beautiful. The, the fabric seems to shimmer because there is a triangular uh, prism-like structure in, in the silk fibers. It, it gives it this sort of iridescent uh, quality. And, and so for its uh, functionality and its beauty, silk is much prized. There was a law in the Han Dynasty that actually forbade commoners um, from wearing silk brocade and embroidered silk because that was supposed to be reserved for uh, the elites. So it, it wasn't proper, it wasn't considered proper for someone lower down uh, on the socioeconomic hierarchy to have this uh, uh, luxury good. Moreover, Silk is the ideal commodity to trade along an overland uh, desert route. Why is that the case? Well, it's very light, but it's very valuable. So it's easy to carry a lot of this stuff, uh, and you can make a lot of money on it. Light and value, that's, that's the, the key attributes that you want in a good, uh, for an overland route like this. By contrast, you wouldn't want to um, try to carry something uh, over the 
overland route of the Silk Road that's really heavy and not all that expensive. So you wouldn't want to haul, you know, uh, lumber, for example. It's super heavy, it's super bulky, it's very hard to move, and it's not really worth that much. Silk also does not spoil, which is another consideration if we're talking about a long journey. If you are uh, carrying something that is perishable, then that can be really difficult because you have to get it uh, um, to your destination um, quickly. Quick travel sometimes is not possible along the Silk Road. And so, uh, something like silk is very appropriate. So if silk is the tip-top commodity along the Silk Road, the very highest quality of silk, the most sought-after piece, the, the very best that you could possibly get, is something that is known as Chinese brocade. This was a very specialized type of silk, which is already uh, a really specialized textile, but only master weavers are able to produce this, and this technology to make it only exists in China at the time. Now, what is brocade? What makes it special? Um, it is a type of silk in which the, the pattern is actually uh, uh, woven into the fabric and it's woven at different levels so you get this kind of raised pattern in the fabric. Uh, to make this requires a very complex loom that can change levels and, and weave at different uh, heights simultaneously. So you think about a loom, a loom is already a, a very complicated uh, piece of machinery uh, and then taking that and, and making it so that it can weave you know, at three or four different levels in, in a piece of fabric at the same time. So that's, that's what brocade is, that's what we're looking at here. This is not something that is embroidered on the fabric uh, after it, it has been made. It's, it's actually part of uh, this um, uh, fabric that makes up um, the shirt here. You were really somebody if you could get your hands on Chinese brocade in um, the first couple centuries CE. This was uh, very expensive. This was the, the tip of the top uh, in terms of high quality luxury uh, silk. And the Chinese are the only ones who, who have that. Uh, they have this thing that nobody else can make. It, it's a very valuable commodity. It's great for trading along the Silk Road. Uh, but then what do you get in return for it? Well, um, probably the most sought after thing was, not surprisingly, something that could not be easily acquired in China. And initially, that was horses. So the Chinese traded silk for horses. After many centuries of warfare with nomads, it was pretty clear to the Chinese that cavalry is a very, very effective military weapon. That the advantage of cavalry over the Chinese style chariot, this very heavy kind of ponderous uh, chariot, had been demonstrated. Cavalry is much uh, uh, quicker, more adaptable, you have greater range, uh, you can go over rougher terrain, and, and so this, this has been kind of demonstrated in the Chinese experience fighting against uh, the steppe nomads that, you know, just all of these advantages of cavalry. The problem for the Chinese is that horses do not do as well in China as they do uh, on the steppe. And so generally, uh, Chinese horses are uh, smaller, not as, as physically uh, impressive. Han Wudi, the martial emperor, wanted to have some of these big, beautiful, powerful horses that uh, um, the, the steppe empires had access to. 
and they came from the westernmost part of the western regions, a place known as the Fergana Valley. Uh, so that's what we're, we're looking at that up here on the map. This is, uh, the, the Haitian Corridor would be off this way. Uh, um, uh, we're kind of right in Central Asia here. Uh, but very good horse country here in, in what is known as the Fergana Valley. Uh, the Chinese were very impressed with, with the horses from this region. They, they called them the blood-sweating horses. Nobody really knows uh, uh, where that name came from, but speculation is that they, these, these animals were just so kind of massive uh, uh, and, and awe-inspiring to the Chinese. And when they sweat, they, they, you know, these huge drops of sweat would pour off of their bodies that looked uh, uh, like big drops of blood. Um, so that's that's probably where that name came from, um, but uh, according to legend, these these horses had interbred with uh, uh, with divine horses. Um, so very clear that that these are prized animals, and um, you know they were they were large, they were strong, they were powerful. Uh, they were a really really um, key military technology. And steppe leaders were well aware of that. One of the reasons why these horses grew so large and powerful is that they had access to alfalfa, a very nutritious species of grass uh, that comes from this region. Uh, and it's, it's the kind of ideal horse country. Um, and in fact, this is the part of the world where horses evolved. The king of Dawan, a steppe group, um, recognized the value of his horses so much that he actually killed the first envoy from the Han who, who asked him to buy horses. Uh, you know, wouldn't even consider it. Uh, this, this ambassador was killed uh, for even asking. So think about you can think about these horses as as like the, these are the top uh, you know uh, military technology of the day, right? It, it would be like um, an envoy from some foreign country coming to the United States and asking for the latest and greatest uh, stealth fighter jet. You know, it's just you're not going to give that up. Uh, that's going to be reserved exclusively for your own use, and uh, that is how these horses were treated. Eventually, however, the Han Dynasty is able to, to get their hands on uh, some of these horses, uh, several thousand of them, in fact. And they were able to do that by uh, trading horses for silk. In time, lots of other luxury goods, high-value commodities, are traded back and forth along the Silk Road routes. So again, you want to have something that is light but valuable, or uh, something that can move on its own. So for example, horses, right? You can uh, take a bunch of silk, uh, get a few horses, and then these horses can actually uh, uh, move themselves back along the trade route with you. Here, what we're looking at is, is some luxury goods, precious stones like lapis lazuli, which only comes from a, a part of uh, Central Asia in what is now uh, Afghanistan. Carnelian, uh, which is, is this one down here. Uh, there are resins for um, incense like frankincense and myrrh. Or excuse me, actually, this one up here is is carnelian, uh, precious stone, and and this this is a resin that would be used to create uh, incense. Uh, it's frankincense, and then a whole host of spices, uh, herbs, things like this that that require very uh, particular growing conditions, and uh, um, you know some of these things can't be grown in China, uh, or there are things from South China that can't be grown in Central Asia. Uh, and so things like this are traded uh, with great frequency along the Silk Road. 
Now, any time that you have people moving around, any time you have material culture moving around, um, you also have ideas moving around. Artistic inspiration, for example, works its way across Eurasia in the same way that uh, material goods and, and people are moving around. And so what we're, what we're looking at here is a bronze cup from western China, Shaanxi province, 4th century CE, that has the same motif as um, a, a sarcophagus from Rome, from the Mediterranean world, at about the same time. Now the, the bronze cup is kind of deteriorated, it's a little bit hard to see that, uh, but it, it's this very sim design that is carved into this uh, sarcophagus from Rome. What we're looking at here are two cherubs engaged in winemaking. Now both of those things, the, the cherub themselves, uh, uh, or puti, and winemaking, the, these are things that are native to the Mediterranean world. Uh, but they would be things that were exotic to East Asia. Uh, uh, cherubs are not a something that's part of the the East Asian um, uh, kind of cosmology mythology, uh, and winemaking is 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 not native to East Asia. Grapes and, and things like this these come from the Mediterranean, but nonetheless we we have this same design uh, that's being depicted on this gilt bronze cup. Here is, I think, an even better example. This is one of my favorite artifacts, really, in, in all of world history. Uh, uh, it's this fascinating piece known as the Coin of Kanishka. Uh, but before we get into this, let me just mention to you that uh, we're not talking about a direct connection between China and Rome, or, or even between uh, different regions of the Mediterranean and, and Eurasia. All of this trade, all of this interconnection, is reliant upon various uh, middlemen, if you will. And so the Mediterranean world and East Asia, uh, the Chinese Empire, represent two poles. But in between, you've got all kinds of different groups. You've got Indians, you've got Persians, you've got Arabs, you've got uh, uh, um, nomadic people from the steppe. And they all kind of add their own touches to this cultural mixing, this material culture, these ideas that are moving across the Silk Road. And all of that is very well illustrated with this artifact right here, the, the coin of Kanishka. If you remember, the Indian king Kanishka the Great, uh, he was the ruler of the Kushan Empire in the mid second century CE. He was a big Buddhist patron the Kushans were a, a trading people. Uh, they were very much plugged into Silk Road networks from the start. And, and we, we noted that they, they were the ones who were really responsible for uh, taking Buddhism out of India and then spreading it into the Silk Road trade network. And so we see a ton of cultural mixing uh, in their artifacts. The coin of Kanishka, uh, first of all, just the, the, the form of it is um, similar to a Greek style coin in which you would have the, the face of the king on one side, so that's over here on the left, and then on the reverse would be um, a Greek deity. And so here we, we have a deity, uh, this, it happens to be a Buddhist deity in this case, but you've got the you've got an image of the king and then a deity. This uh, kind of woven looking pattern around the edge of the coin is based upon the Roman orus, a type of coin that was in circulation at this uh, in this era. The inscription on the coin is in a northwestern dialect of Sanskrit written in Greek letters. 
So a combination of this, this Central Asian language written in the Greek alphabet, and it says, King of Kings, Kanishka of Kushana, right here along the edge of the coin. Uh, this side over here that shows a, a Buddha with a halo. Both the image of the deity and the image of Kanishka, the ruler, are depicted in what is known as the steppe nomad pose. Uh, this is a, an artistic style that's typical of Central Asia. And that is um, with the uh, uh, facing forward, so the body facing forward and the feet uh, turned outward. You can see that in both cases you have the body facing forward and then the feet are turned uh, outward, uh, pointing out to the sides. Uh, the image of Kanishka, he's, he's dressed as a, a nomad, a nomadic horse riding archer, uh, which is what the Kushans initially were, and so continues to, to depict himself in this traditional dress. Uh, even though by this time the Kushans are masters of a settled uh, empire. This coin, uh, th this, this specific coin, was discovered in a Buddhist stupa uh, near Jalalabad in what is today Pakistan. So it just illustrates all of the things that we're talking about. Cultural mixing, networks, uh, combinations of, of different uh, uh, regions coming together and being being modified, uh, and then this this fundamental connection between the spread of Buddhism and the Silk Road. So really fascinating uh, artifact here, and one that I actually got to see in person. Uh, it is uh, it belongs to the collection uh, of of the Met uh, uh, Metropolitan Museum uh, in New York City, and and I had the pleasure of uh, seeing that. Uh, up close and in person uh, last year. It's actually uh, fairly small, but still, uh, that was that was quite an experience. All right, so now let's turn our attention to the maritime route of the Silk Road. And at the at the same time as the Overland route uh, is expanding, the the maritime route is also becoming more and more traveled, uh, which. Um, in, in the same way that the Overland Route does, links the eastern and western parts of Eurasia together. Now, to give you an extent, uh, or to, to give you an idea of the extent, rather, uh, let's look at this source here, known as Periplus of the Erythrean Sea, or Periplus of the Red Sea. Uh, what this is, it's a, it's a maritime guide that was written in Greek from the first century CE. The author is unknown, but it is clearly written by someone with first-hand knowledge of these places. It summarizes a huge list of various ports of call all along the Red Sea, the Arabian Peninsula, the uh, uh, Indian coast, and even down the East African coast. The description includes um, a, a list of the different goods that can be bought and sold in all of these ports of call, um, what the prevailing prices are, uh, um, and where you can go to, to get specific things. There is, for example, a mention of Chinese silks in Western India. In, in all of these ports here. So this is quite a fascinating historical source from the Mediterranean, written in Greek, but then uh, uh, talks about all of these Indian Ocean ports in great detail. You know, so clearly written by someone who had either first-hand knowledge of these places uh, or direct access to people with that first-hand knowledge. Why is it that um, these Indian Ocean routes were becoming more and more traveled during this time? 
It's made possible by a couple of new inventions, the Dow and the Latin sail. The Dow is this thing here. It's a small to medium-sized merchant ship with a very sleek cross-section. Uh, so it's, it's fairly fast. And it is rigged with a triangular sail known as a Latin. That term Latin uh, actually means Latin rigged, and it is so named because for a long time, historians thought that this was a Roman invention. Uh, it shows up in the Mediterranean in the mid-first century, and so, uh, oh, it must have been invented by the Romans. Um, well, it's now considered to be either an Indian or Arab invention uh, as early as the 5th century BCE. And that's only really recently uh, become uh, um, kind of accepted, indicating that it, it's one of many examples of, of things that uh, there, there's sort of this bias towards Rome, kind of privileging Rome as being the originator of, of many of the things that in fact were the result of um, cultural mixing and hybridization that Rome uh, adapted from other places. Rome, uh, uh, Roman society is very much plugged into the trade networks of the Mediterranean and the Silk Road. Uh, and so that's, that's precisely how the um, Latin sail makes its way into the Mediterranean. Uh, that takes place in the mid-first century CE. But what is it about this sail that is so significant? How does the Latin sail and the Dow aid uh, Indian Ocean trade? If you recall, one of the key features of the Indian Ocean uh, is the monsoon cycle. The monsoon cycle is, is essentially a change in the prevailing winds. They blow one direction for half the year, they blow the other direction uh, for the other half of the year. That's all well and good. If you are sailing a boat that has square sails, like this one uh, pictured up here, you can basically only go in the same direction as the wind. Square sails, uh, are th this is just one of their, their attributes that you're, you're essentially sailing in the same direction as the wind. You can kind of moderate your course a little bit, um, but not much. A triangular sail, on the other hand, is sort of like the blade of a fan, and you can angle that in such a way so that the ship can move almost directly into the wind. With a triangular sail, you can sail almost directly into the wind itself. What does that mean for the Indian Ocean? Well, it means that uh, you're not so limited by the monsoon cycle anymore. If you're sailing around the Indian Ocean with square sails, you can only go one direction for half the year and the other direction for the other half the year. So that means, if, let's say you travel from uh, the Arabian Peninsula to India, the western coast of India, uh, and you want to get back, well, you've got to wait for the, the monsoons uh, to shift back the other direction before uh, you go back. If you have a boat that can sail in the same direction as the wind, or, or rather uh, into the wind, you are freed from that limitation. So you can go I either direction uh, at all times of the year with the Latin sail. So that's a great innovation that really stimulates travel along the Indian Ocean. Those goods that were taking the maritime route, um, many of them would be offloaded into ports along the Arabian Peninsula. From there, it would be transported across the desert and into the Mediterranean through the Arab caravan networks. So this part of the world, here and through the Red Sea uh, and through here, represents a crucial middle link between China, Central Asia, and 
the Mediterranean. Uh, and so you can actually see all of those cultures mixing uh, in this part of the world. That's something that we'll return to when, when we uh, focus on the Arabian Peninsula specifically. Now because of that, and because of this, this location uh, between all of these different regions, you can see cultural mixing um, quite clearly in the Arabian Peninsula. Some of you may recognize what we're looking at here. This is, uh, well it's a camel there in, in the foreground, but in the background is a structure that is known as al Khazna, literally means the treasury, and it is featured in the movie Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, uh, where our hero, Indiana Jones, uh, uh, is chasing after the Holy Grail, the cup that Jesus of Nazareth used uh, during the Last Supper. So that's where you may have seen it. Uh, the Grail is not actually here, unfortunately, uh, but uh, this is nonetheless a very impressive uh, structure. It's located right along those uh, caravan trade routes that we were just talking about in the trading city of Petra. Uh, Petra is in the, the modern nation of Jordan today. al Khazna was a mausoleum built in the first century CE uh, and it's carved directly into this great sandstone face. Where we can see cultural mixing is in these Greek deities that are carved into the reliefs here. We have Mediterranean style columns and Mediterranean style architecture uh, that is uh, being employed in this great treasury, this, this mausoleum treasury uh, that's out in the middle of um, a trade city along the Silk Road. Here is a picture of Petra at night today. Uh, uh, you can see some people gathered there for this um, uh, sort of candlelight viewing. I just think that that's, that's a really gorgeous shot. Um, but gives you an idea of the scale of al Khazna and uh, just how really breathtaking it is. Fabulous place. So let's tie all of these things back to, to our, our thesis for today. The Silk Road is, is a mechanism that uh, brings together virtually all of Eurasia and a big part of Africa to a certain extent. Now we, we, can't, we don't want to push that too far and say that, oh, we've got some sort of common uh, unified culture uh, uh, along this entire region. No, absolutely not. There's, there's you know, very distinct uh, cultural groups, um, but there are elements of a common culture, and, and there is clear evidence for sustained uh, contact and interaction. So this is what brings us back to this idea of, of globalization. The Silk Road is a terrific example of a pre-modern form of globalization, certainly much more limited than what we're experiencing today in terms of the extent of interconnection and interdependence. Uh, um, but it, it goes to show that globalization itself is not a new phenomenon. This is something that has been going on um, for a long, long time. And so maybe we can kind of collectively stop uh, freaking out about, about it. The Silk Road is a world system then, in, in the sense that it is this vehicle for sustained cross-cultural contact. That's the crucial point that, that really makes it um, you know, more than just a, a kind of limited event or series of events. Uh, it is a long-standing uh, vehicle for sustained cross-cultural contact. Some examples of that um, cross-cultural contact that result in a, you know, forms of common culture, you have things like silk, wine, coinage, imagery, architectural styles, fashion, all of these things that uh, uh, you know, travel along the Silk Road and are shared 
ideas, Greek philosophy, religion, Buddhism in particular, uh, artistic motifs. These are all things that are transported between many different groups along the Silk Road for a long, long time, many centuries. Um, they all morph and change as they are picked up by different groups of people. So you can think of culture as being traded along the Silk Road um, in the same way that commodities are. And as that culture moves across the Silk Road with the people traveling, it changes, uh, but it also uh, uh, changes the culture that it encounters. So that, that influence goes both ways. This is a very significant observation. And we can see all of those things in the spread of Buddhism. The Silk Road is completely responsible for Buddhism becoming the important world religion that it is today. Let's take a look at uh, the route that Buddhism took out of northeastern India and into the rest of the world. Uh, if you look at this map, what is something that immediately jumps out at you concerning this route? It is the Silk Road. Here's the overland route of the Silk Road right here into East Asia. Uh, and here is the maritime route of the Silk Road, or at least a big chunk of it. So Buddhism um, encounters uh, a lot of different cultures, uh, but probably none more significant than China. And we're going to zoom in on this example for the next few minutes because it very clearly illustrates um, the cultural change that occurs when something like Buddhism is introduced into a new place, but then also how that new thing, in this case Buddhism, influences the culture that uh, it encounters. And so we're going to look at how that takes place in China around the second century CE. So remember that in order for Buddhism to get into East Asia, it first has to get out of India. Uh, that, that early version of Buddhism is pretty limited in terms of who could, who could practice it and how appealing it was going to be. Uh, you had to be a monk. There were no gods. There were no temples. It just was not something that uh, could really have mass appeal. It was not a universal religion. But nonetheless, Buddhism gets this huge push when it is adopted by the ruler of the Mauryan Empire. Uh, that is circa um, uh, 4th century BCE. In the wake of Alexander's conquests, uh, the Mauryan Empire uh, becomes uh, uh, a major player in the subcontinent and beyond. So named for Chandragupta Maurya. Uh, he's around, uh, uh, dies in, in the late uh, 3rd century BCE. But then Ashoka is, is the big patron of Buddhism who presides over the empire at its height and then is responsible for um, uh, spreading Buddhism all over his empire. He's, he you know, um, builds a bunch of temples and stupas and, and all kinds of things. If he had not done that. Uh, if, if Ashoka had not become such a big Buddhist patron, uh, it's possible that the religion would have re remained very localized and small scale. Uh, but nonetheless, he, he builds a lot of these uh, fantastic things, such as the, the stupa of Sarnath. This is a, a big Buddhist monument that commemorates the Buddha's first sermon, uh, you can see uh, uh, the people uh, up next to it. it it's an it, extremely impressive structure. Uh, and it's just one of the many things that um, Ashoka built all around India.
But we're still talking about that original limited style of Buddhism. It doesn't yet have mass appeal, even though it has now been um, um, promoted by the, the Mauryan Empire. That changes, though, in the first century BCE. And we're going to go into more detail on that later, but uh, it's really because of the Lotus Sutra. Uh, a key tenet of the Lotus Sutra is that anyone can achieve enlightenment. So you, you don't have to be a monk to practice Buddhism and follow the teachings of Siddhartha Gautama. Uh, the new version of, of Buddhism, the, the Lotus Sutra inspired version um, uh, that is known as Mahayana Buddhism, is adopted by a Central Asian group from the uh, mountainous region of Pakistan. They're from the Hindu Kush mountains. They are the Kushans. We talked about the Kushans uh, uh, in the context of Gandhara and, and that multiculturalism and, and cultural interaction that took place when Greek culture butts up against Indian culture uh, and, and creates this uh, interesting intermixing. But the Kushans are originally a nomadic tribe from Bactria they go on to conquer an empire that encompassed uh, what is today Afghanistan and most of India from about 50 to 375 CE. So the first couple centuries of uh, um, the Common Era, precisely the same period of time that we're talking about the, the rise and expansion of the Silk Road trading networks. The empire is at its height under Kanishka the Great. He's the guy uh, with the coin that we looked at earlier. Kanishka is, like Ashoka many centuries before him, a great Buddhist patron. And it is because of his patronage that Buddhism really spreads out of the subcontinent for the first time uh, and makes its way to the Silk Road. Once Buddhism gets to the Silk Road, then it just starts going every which way. And that is the key corridor that opens up a path into East Asia at the time ruled by the Han Dynasty. Uh, this is all the same era in which King Menander is around. Uh, he, he was that Greek uh, Bactrian king who converted to Buddhism, uh, uh, right? So that, that cultural mixing uh, there in that region. Uh, after the Kushans, though, Buddhism is never really that influential in India again. And, and what becomes the, the center of the Buddhist world? It's China. And it remains that way for many centuries after. Uh, here's an example of the spread of Buddhism along the Silk Road. The, this is the, the famous uh, Bamiyan Buddha. There was actually two of these giant uh, uh, sculptures carved into a, a huge rock face uh, in what is today Afghanistan. Built in the 6th century CE, these things are massive uh, uh, and stood for a long, long time until they were destroyed by the Taliban uh, in 2001. So uh, similar to, to what we saw with the, uh, the destruction of uh, ancient Persian uh, and Roman artifacts, you know, but the, this, these, um, uh, this statuary it represents um, something that's, that's anathema to, to the worldview uh, uh, of uh, these people that, that needs to be erased and destroyed, you know, uh, uh, doing away with that history and, and inventing uh, a new identity by, uh, by destroying it. That is why uh, these impressive artifacts were destroyed. Um, there is currently an effort underway uh, to rebuild these uh, these things, but this is you know you don't really think about Afghanistan as, as some sort of Buddhist hotbed, but it used to be. And and here's these giant um, um, sculptures uh, that stood along the Silk Road in Afghanistan, uh, what is today Afghanistan, um, in the sixth century. Eventually, Buddhism does make its way into China. There's two theories about the, the route that uh, it took. 
and they, they correspond to the maritime uh, route of the Silk Road and the Overland route. The maritime theory is that Buddhism spread across the Indian Ocean into southern China, uh, so kind of went this way through Southeast Asia and uh, um, made it to South China. South China is the, the, the maritime region of China. And there it is taken up by one Prince Liu of Chu. Uh, Chu was the, one of the, the states uh, during the Warring States era. Um, but uh, first century CE and because of this introduction uh, in South China, it gradually uh, kind of moves north uh, from there. There's some evidence to support this, but there, there seems to be a greater preponderance of evidence that supports the overland route. Uh, there's more archaeological evidence that uh, seems to suggest that Buddhism traveled along the overland route of the Silk Road into China. It spread out from what is today Afghanistan into western China, eventually makes it to Luoyang, which is the Han capital. I've, I've put it in the big red dot there on the map. And uh, here it, it is not Prince Liu uh, of South China, but rather Emperor Ming of the Han, who is, is kind of the first you know, major figure uh, to take up Buddhism. He is around in the mid uh, first century CE. There's a legend about Emperor Ming that he had a dream. He, he, ta he saw a tall man who was shimmering gold and had a glowing head, uh, um, had this great, you know, sort of halo about him. Uh, he asks his advisors the next day uh, who this man was, what did he see in his dream, and they say, oh, there is such a man who lives far to the west, uh, he is called Buddha, and he has attained the Tao. And so remember, the, the Tao is this old uh, uh, Chinese cosmological uh, idea, um, the, the way of the universe, right? The, the natural state of the world uh, uh, is the Tao. And so if, if you are able to live in harmony with the Tao, you, you kind of achieve, uh, you know, that's the ideal. You, you've achieved the... Um, uh, harmony with the natural world and things will be good. And so th this is the, the way in which uh, Emperor Ming's advisors described enlightenment, Buddhist enlightenment. And so, so the Buddha has, he has achieved the Tao. Uh, Emperor Ming then decides to send emissaries to the West to learn about this new religion and those emissaries come back carrying Buddhist sutras uh, and riding white horses. And so to commemorate that, uh, Emperor Ming has a temple built in the year 68 CE, uh, which is known as the White Horse Temple. That's what we're looking at here. Uh, um, and this is uh, a rebuilt version of it that stands today and uh, you know, supposedly is, is established uh, as a result of um, this. Now, that's a great story. Uh, it probably does not accurately reflect the, the real spread of Buddhism into China. Uh, it, it's more likely that it was spread via missionaries, uh, just so, sort of ordinary folks traveling um, uh, the Silk Road trade networks. The truth is that we, we don't know specifically. Um, there's not a single event or kind of series of events that we can point to and say, aha, here's the moment when Buddhism makes it into China. Uh, but we can say that Buddhism was patronized by Emperor Ming by the mid-first century CE. Uh, and then about a century later, there is a, a Buddhist church in the Han capital, Luoyang, um, in, in the year 148 CE. So it, you know, we're talking about a process that starts in the mid-first century CE, and it's clearly made significant inroads, inroads into Chinese society about a century later. What was Chinese society like at this time? Well, it turns out that there was a number of uh, aspects of Chinese culture that were not really compatible with Buddhist ideology and make Buddhism kind of a hard sell at first. For example, there's a long tradition 
in in Han uh, in the Han era of ancestor worship. You had a, a family shrine in the home. There's lots of uh, localized folk deities that are associated with very particular lineages and very particular places. There's an idea that the heavenly order is reflected upon earth. So this this is central to to the uh, the mandate of heaven ideology. The emperor is is the son of heaven, Tian Shi. Uh, he's responsible for maintaining uh, uh, order on earth. And if he does something wrong, you know, if if he's not if he doesn't rule in a proper and just way, then um, things are going to be out of whack on earth. He'll lose the mandate of heaven, and a, a new dynasty is justified in uh, taking over. There is also a, a strong um, respect for traditions, uh, a kind of conservatism that has its roots in Confucian philosophy. The, the kind of fundamental orientation of, of Confucian uh, scholars is that we look to the past. We look to the wisdom of the past uh, as a model for how things should be done. It's, it's a fundamentally conservative ideology. But then, you know, it's not just all kind of Confucianism. You, you do have remnants of the, the legalist framework, especially in, uh, um, in terms of crime, punishment, and justice that uh, uh, was put in place by the Qin. Well, all of those amount to some various incompatibilities uh, when it comes to Buddhism. For example, the, the Buddhist idea of the non-existence of things and the non-existence of the self. This is a, a very stark contrast to Confucian empiricism. Uh, you know, Confucian philosophers are all about observing what actually happens. How do people behave? Uh, uh, and you know, in, in this scenario or that scenario, what can we see happening, and then you know, make make judgments based on that. So it, it's it's a very empirical approach, uh, not just to to um, the physical world, but to uh, philosophy. Well, you know, this kind of uh, uh, nebulous idea of, of non-existence is, is very foreign. It's also not really in line with the, the Taoist concept that everything sort of flows from the natural world. You know, that Taoism is, is very kind of metaphysical as well, but it, it's grounded in this notion that um, the, the key example of everything, uh, the, the ultimate source uh, from which ideas, philosophy, uh, and the order of the universe flows is to be seen in nature. So it too has, has kind of uh, uh, this dose of empiricism that is not really um, present in, in Buddhist philosophy. Another sticking point is um, the Buddhist idea of the five aggregates. Uh, you know, the five aggregates are, that's kind of what uh, comes together to make up you, and so there's, there's no real permanent you. Uh, after you die, these things break apart. They can be combined in different ways, and so there's no there's no sort of permanent you, right? Uh, that's very different from from the Chinese um, um, cosmological notion in which you do have permanent souls. You actually have two permanent souls. There's um, uh, your your spiritual soul uh, um, is kind of the uh, the thing that is your identity. So your um, personality, uh, you know, these types of things. That's one of your permanent souls. And then you also have uh, a, a corporeal soul, which is kind of like the life force that animates your body. Uh, these two things come together when you're alive to make you who you are, but they continue on uh, uh, or at least your your spiritual soul continues on after you die, uh, even as your uh, your corporeal soul is, you know no longer animates the body. Uh, this is why, for example, you can contact dead ancestors. The the spiritual soul never goes away, right? It's permanent, so um, that's that's why you can communicate with your ancestors. If if you have something like the five aggregates and there's no permanent 
being, then how are you supposed to venerate your ancestors? You know, there, there's no thing there to, to um, venerate. There are some other practical matters that made uh, uh, Buddhism, uh, the early version of Buddhism, incompatible with Chinese culture. So the withdrawing from the world, going off and living as a monastery, uh, as a monk in a monastery, um, being celibate, uh, uh, you know, re rejecting earthly connections. None of that is really in line with Confucian ethics. Uh, you know, in, in Confucianism, you're you're supposed to stick around and be a good uh, uh, filial son or daughter. You're you're supposed to take care of your parents and then later your children. Um, so you know you're not supposed to be celibate. Uh, you're not supposed to withdraw from the world. You're you're supposed to acknowledge your place in the hierarchy and then perform your obligations, right, to those above you and those below you. Um, also, not really in line with with the philosophy of, of the state of being a productive subject. You know how how do you be a, a a good subject in in the Han Empire? You're supposed to farm and pay your taxes, uh, not withdraw off to a monastery in the mountains or go meditate in a cave. You know th this doesn't help anybody. Uh, so all of these things make Buddhism um, not particularly attractive at first. In Chinese culture. How are these contradictions dealt with though when when Buddhism first makes its way into East Asia? Uh, as we saw with the dream of Emperor Ming, a lot of this Buddhist uh, uh, ideas are explained uh, by Taoist parallels. So in Emperor Ming's dream he has he, he uh, asks his advisors and they say, yeah, there's this guy out in the West called Buddha. He has achieved the Tao. That was the best way that they had to describe this phenomenon of enlightenment, right? E extinguishment, non-existence that uh, uh, Siddhartha has achieved. So, so the way uh, becomes equated with the idea of the Buddhist Dharma. Um, Elimination of desire, right? This this is one of the four noble truths. Well, that's very similar to the Taoist idea of a harmony with nature, of of becoming uncomplicated. You know, simple is better. Uh, um, you don't want to sort of cloud your ideas and your actions up with with all this artificial stuff. Well, that's that's awful lot like uh, eliminating desire in Buddhism. So these these are the ways in which Buddhism is is initially um, described. In China, and you can actually see that uh, in in the terminology itself. It, it's it sort of conflates these two things that are similar, but you know there's some key differences between Buddhism and Taoism. And that's what we're looking at here: is um, the the very words themselves made Buddhism seem like another version of Taoism initially. So th this word over here is uh, uh, Tao, uh, literally means the the way or the path or the road. Uh, uh, that's the word that's used uh, in, in the Taoist context of, uh, of the way. And it was also initially used to describe the, the Buddhist Dharma, the Buddhist concept of, of the way, um, the Dharma. Now that um, is, is then, you know, intermittently uh, uh, distinguished with other words. For example, this, this word here, um, which in Japanese is pronounced as kata, uh, which also means way, uh, but has not the connotation of, of a physical uh, path like this one, like road, but um, like a method or a technique. Uh, and, and so uh, that term was thrown in there as well, uh, which kind of further complicates things. And eventually, th th we're talking about several centuries later, um, these terms are separated out so that you have this word being explicitly uh, um, linked to Taoist ideas, and this term over here, uh, which also means way or method or law, becoming the term that is used to describe the Buddhist Dharma. But that separation uh, uh, and clarification of these different nuances takes a long time to develop. So there's a lot of confusion at first. Uh, but eventually this does happen, and so today when, when you see this word you know, used in its philosophical sense, that, that refers to the kind of Taoist 
sense of the way. This term here means the Buddhist Dharma, the Buddhist law or, or method. Uh, uh, and this, this middle term uh, means like a, a specific technique that, that is employed for something. Uh, there are other methods, though. It's, it's not just terminology and the, the clarification of, of nuance that um, uh, kind of muddy the waters, so to speak. There are new forms of Buddhism that uh, come to be popular in China, uh, which, which further kind of obscure the difference between Buddhism, Taoism, and folk religion, but also at the same time make Buddhism more appealing. So savior figures, uh, like the Amida Buddha. Here's, here's a, a Japanese uh, statue of the Amida Buddha. Uh, the Buddha of mercy, right? Well, this is a, something similar. This is a deity that's very similar to um, deceased ancestors, right? Beings that you can appeal to uh, for help. You can pray to the Amida Buddha, uh, who will offer you mercy. It's very similar to... You, you beseech your, your deceased ancestors to help you. And uh, deities like the Amida Buddha then further become fused with various local gods. Uh, uh, this is a process that is, is um, you can really clearly see this in uh, Japan. But the, they're, they're understood as being different manifestations of, of the Buddha. You know, so the, the Amida Buddha has all these different forms, and oh, that's uh, that's essentially our local god, uh, uh, you know, X or Y. So you've got the the combining of different deities and traditions together, uh, which kind of results in the situation where um, everything's sort of mixed up. The Chinese deity Guanyin is a good example of that fusion. <clears throat> Guanyin represents a, a transformation of the Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara. And this is a little bit later than the time period that we're focusing on, um, but still uh, appropriate for our theme here. This is around the 9th century or so CE. Uh, Avalokiteshvara is, is originally a, a Buddhist deity uh, who was a protector, and his role was to guide souls to paradise. Uh, very popular with soldiers, with traders, people in dangerous professions. Uh, you know this this protector deity who something bad happens to you uh, will will see to it that you make it to paradise. Avalokiteshvara is always depicted as a male deity in Indian art. That's the, these images here on the left. But becomes transformed into a female deity of mercy, grafted onto this existing um, uh, deity, Guan Yin, because it better suits Chinese sensibilities. So Avalokiteshvara becomes uh, Guan Yin. Guan Yin becomes this sort of amalgam, this hybrid deity uh, uh, that's that's a combination between a Chinese folk deity and these these Indian Buddhist uh, attributes. Why is Guan Yin Avalokiteshvara uh, transformed into a woman? Well, in Chinese culture, men are not strongly associated with compassion. Uh, that's a female trait. So Avalokiteshvara's kind of main uh, quality, compassion, mercy. You know, that's not, th these are not typically male traits. That's something that you, you need a female deity for in Chinese culture. The Queen Mother of the West uh, is a Chinese deity who will take you to the Western paradise. It's kind of a, a, a version of, of heaven. Uh, well, that sounds an awful lot like this protector deity, Avalokiteshvara. So these two things are combined uh, and become uh, uh, this, this essentially hybrid or syncretized deity known as Guan Yin. 
Guan Yin is always depicted as a female deity in, uh, in Chinese art. Actually, sometimes a, a, a male or female in, in Japanese art, but that's, that's beside the point. Uh, but is this female protector and mercy god in Chinese culture? Here's, here's an ink painting of her, uh, and here's this grand uh, statue of Guan Yin in China. So that's precisely that mixing, that adaptation that we're talking about. Uh, you can see that the original Indian Buddhist culture is uh, adapted and changed to be more suitable to Chinese culture. Uh, but then Chinese culture is adapted, right? All these Buddhist attributes are grafted onto the existing Queen Mother of the West to create uh, uh, the hybrid Guanyin that we have with us today. Another good example of this adaptation, um, revision of Indian culture, can be seen in architecture, material culture. You've all probably seen a pagoda before. It is a, it, an iconic uh, type of East Asian structure. Originated, though, as the Indian stupa. The stupa is uh, a Buddhist reliquary. So something that houses the remains of, of the Buddha himself or later on uh, Buddhist saints uh, becomes these uh, sites for pilgrimage uh, uh, and so on. So the, the stupa... Here, here's a, a traditional Indian style stupa. As Buddhist culture moves along the Silk Road and into East Asia, uh, it becomes modified uh, and, and transforms into something that looks like this. This is a very early Chinese stupa slash pagoda. Uh, this is actually one that is um, located in the reconstructed White Horse Temple, one of the earliest Buddhist institutions in East Asia and then is continued uh, further modified into the form of the uh, East Asian pagoda. And that's what we're, we're looking at here on the right. This is actually a Japanese pagoda uh, from a temple called Kofukuji. So this happens um, in the first couple centuries CE during the Han Dynasty. Buddhism makes its way into East Asia, uh, but in the in the Han era, still rather limited. It's a religion of the upper class. Uh, we talked about how uh, you know Emperor Ming is is the first kind of major figure to to be a Buddhist patron. Um, it it starts out in this way. It's it's this interesting kind of foreign curiosity amongst well-to-do people, amongst the upper classes. Um, and, and wealthy converts like Emperor Ming are the ones responsible for building this, this initial Buddhist infrastructure in China. It takes some time for the religion to filter down to the populace. And in that uh, aspect, this is the exact opposite of, the, say, the introduction of Christianity into the Mediterranean world, which is originally the religion of the lower classes that then filters upward. Buddhism takes the opposite uh, route in East Asia. It's an elite religion that uh, gradually filters down uh, through society. It is in the subsequent dynasty, the Tang dynasty, that we can really see Buddhism uh, flourishing across all elements of Chinese society um, and, and then further afield in East Asia in places like Korea and Japan. Buddhism becomes a major religion in China from about 600 to 1200 or so, uh, then declines a little bit, but still remains strong in China and even stronger in Japan. Here are your key terms for today's session. The Silk Road and the First World System.